Hey everybody, Dr. Dan here. Welcome back. Uh, this week we're talking about chapter 14 and I've been interrupted on the first three takes. So uh, hopefully this one will come off without a hitch. I have to go really quick uh, and I have my timer started. So uh, there's a lot to cover in a short period of time. We don't have an assignment this week, which is great, but you are gonna have a couple of quiz questions from this chapter uh, on the quiz that's next week. So listen up. Uh, I'll give you those quiz questions near the end of this lecture if everything goes well. And this lecture will be a little long, but hopefully under 15 minutes. So uh, culture and splendor, all right? Cultures of splendor and power, 1500 to 1780. You know, all right, that doesn't really give us too much information. It just tells us that uh, some people had a lot of money and were still living this, you know, lavish uh, lifestyle, these empires. So we're gonna talk about the Muslim empires, uh, of this period of time and we're going to skip past China and Japan to some extent and get into Europe and talk about the Enlightenment because I think there's a, an interesting conversations about science and advancement and religion when we talk about the Enlightenment which is really at the end of this chapter in the western part of the world, Western Europe, uh, not quite the Americas yet. The other thing that's striking as you look at this chapter title is the, the periodization, the dating of it, 1500 to 1780. Okay, well, most of us, if you you know just had history in high school or whatever, you know you know that uh, you know something about before 1500. You know that in 1492 Columbus sailed the ocean blue, so you know that part. But then you pretty much don't know anything else except you know that 1776 was an important year because it was the American Revolution and. You know, maybe you know the Russian Revolution in the 1900s, probably not. But anyway, you know these big dates before 1500 and after 1776. Uh, Those are the ones that stick in the head of the average, you know, Western like American person. Uh, and I realize not everyone in this class is from this culture, but I, I think it gives you this general idea that this is a period of time that there's sort of a gap. So that's why it's important. And one of the big things that comes out of this is that you know there's a lot in here about trade and commerce and we covered all that in the last chapter we talked about the atlantic uh, slave trade and sort of that cyclical atlantic history um and but what we also the underlying theme there was about all these advancements in technology and in transportation and and also you know the invention of the press all right the printing press and books and so how in the 1400s and 1500s uh, the idea of, of uh, movable type, you know, printing technology comes together with the technology of transportation and now you get like old school internet, right? You get all of these pages, all of these books uh, traveling throughout the world in different cultures, not all cultures, but there begins to be not only a cultural mixing, but a mixing of ideas. So that's a big thing that happens in this era overall. And um, again, uh, we're, we're not going to get into trade and culture too much uh, at this point in time because I think we've studied that enough. But we know that that trade was going on and, and we remember, you know, the reason that Columbus, you know, went west was because, you know, that he wanted to avoid, you know, or, or traders, uh, European traders wanted to avoid the Ottoman Empire and taxes and that sort of thing. So, so we know that part. And we talked a little bit about the Ottoman Empire before, and I'm only fascinated with the Ottoman Empire because it was a very vital society, maybe much like our own, that lasted for 18, 800 years, so or at least. So, you know, we're not there yet. So this is like the Roman Empire. You know, it's important. It was vital. It was sophisticated with lots of advancements, and it's something we need to pay attention to. So really, the Ottoman Empire is the beginning of this section that talks about these three great Muslim empires. Uh, in this period of time. And so the first one is the Ottoman Empire. And then the second one, which is, which is uh, basically like Turkey today, all right? And then, and then the second one um, is uh, uh, the Safavids, and that's the Shiite state. So the Safavids uh, are modern day uh, Iran, okay? And the Shiite Muslims versus the Sunni Muslims. So Sunni Muslims are the Ottoman Empire, Shiite Muslims, are uh, the Persian Empire, the Savahid uh, Empire, and, and uh, the Savahids are much more, the Shiites are much more strict and conservative religiously, all right? There's a lot more to it than that, and unfortunately we don't have time, nor do we have the person uh, to fill you in on Islam, but that's a big difference between those two cultures, all right? 
uh, Persia is the is the strict modern day Iran, still very strict, same religion, same thing, uh, versus you know the Ottoman Empire, which was very tolerant, and that's the cool thing about the Ottoman Empire. You know, Christians could live there, Jews could live there, uh, you know, Shiites could live there. Where in in uh, Persia, in the Shiite state, they were very strict, and they would persecute. Uh, you know, Sunnis for sure, you know, Christians forget it, and even Shiites who didn't agree with them. It didn't exist. It was very strict, much like today. And then that third big Muslim empire uh, that we'll, we'll learn more about, I promise, is the Mughal, and that's, oop, did I go too far? Yeah, the Mughal Empire, and that's basically India, okay, modern day India. So that's the other, the other third great Muslim empire in this time period that had a lot of power. And, and the Mughals obviously were pretty tolerant because if you know the history of India at all, you know, erase, erase Pakistan from the map, Pakistan, current day Pakistan and current day India were all India at one time. And the Pakistans are the Muslims and the Indians now are the Hindus. But under the Mughals, it was all one thing and it was run by Muslims who had to be very tolerant of other religions because half their country were Hindus at that time. And it was really hard to keep all that together and it comes down to the Indian national, it's, it's a long story, but we'll learn more about that. But, but anyway, that's the third big uh, empire of, uh, of uh, Islam uh, during this time period in, in India. So that's what the first part of the chapter covers. And, and there's a lot, I mean, just if you don't want to read all this, just look at the art and some of the work. It's, you know, you think we're sophisticated. You know, the arts in these, these uh, East Asian cultures is absolutely uh, incredible. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, pop through really quick. Uh, pay attention to Africa and the money there. And I think the interesting thing here is everyone talks about the slave trade and the slave ships and, and we kind of know that history a little bit and how terrible all that was. But what most people don't think about is how much money these African empires were making from selling people and also mining gold because of all the gold reserves in Africa. So you'll read a, a little bit about the uh, Asante uh, class and, and Benin, all right? So these are like you know, Northwest sort of African and, and the wealth that was created and the gold that they held. And, and certainly these cultures were the richest in Africa, but, but I would argue they were the richest in the world. And, and if you look at history before this period of time, okay, before 1500, uh, for sure the richest people in the world were uh, Africans who had these empires built around gold. And when you read about the Asante, uh, culture on these pages, you'll see these very sophisticated bronzes and these, I mean, really beautiful people. I, I mean, I think it's, I think it's pretty incredible. And uh, when you read about it, you read that, you know, from, from what I get out of these cultures, they were very materialistic, much like we are, because they had money and they wanted to wear, you know, the ornate gold and all of that sort of stuff. So pretty interesting. Um, um, the most important part of this, I'm not going to say important, I don't want to discount any other culture, but one of the most important parts to understand in this chapter is the Enlightenment in Europe, and that's a very Western-centric thing. It's like I'm sort of an Enlightenment fan, but I am a Western European, you know, American person, so I'm probably biased. Um, but at the same time, I think talking about the Enlightenment gives us a really good perspective of our world today, maybe some dangers in our world today, and also how it plays with the Middle East and why why Islam and the West are, are always kind of separate in, in a lot of ways and why China is also. So I have to go really quick because I'm already at like eight minutes. So the Enlightenment wasn't a period of time that, you know, someone opened the paper one day and said, oh, tomorrow starts the Enlightenment. It wasn't like that. It, it's referring to a broad period of 100 years, 200, 300, 400. I, we're still in the Enlightenment, I think. Uh, but it's this idea of, of Western... Um, scientific traditions and Western liberalism and Western economic theories and it all starts during this period of time and and what you have to understand is that when you're in areas where religion is real strict um, new, or cultures are real strict new ideas are a bad thing the original meaning of the word innovation was a negative all right. You don't want to be innovative. It would get you in trouble because if you were innovative, it meant you thought outside the box. And when the whole world and culture is, is run by religion, thinking outside the box or, you know, saying, hey, there's a sun in the earth instead of, you know, God, 
you know, playing with some things, then all of a sudden, you know, you're in trouble because you're starting to go up against the teachings of the church or the teachings of the strict culture, if, if you understand that. And, and really, so the Enlightenment is this period of time where, you know, after the Reformation, you know, where Catholicism, you know, turned into, you know, or, or, or started to live with secularism. And, uh, you know, after, after the printing press and these books are going around, all of a sudden there's new ideas. And there's new ideas about science, there's new ideas about culture, as I said before. And even though we saw these, if you read this chapter, you read about all the innovation, all the science and all that stuff in these Middle Eastern, uh, uh, there's a goose going by, I hope you can hear it quacking. So in the Middle Eastern empires, all this education, all this rich culture and all this technology, like the steam engine was actually, a crude version was in the Ottoman Empire before it ever was in England. So when you start to consider this, you start to wonder why does the Western world and the Enlightenment sort of happen in Europe, all right, and move to the Americas? Why didn't it come out of Islam or why didn't it come out of China or why were those Islamic cultures, which were so sophisticated even by today's standards as far as knowledge goes about science and the planets and math, where all that stuff really came from, you know, why didn't it advance as much there as it did here? Was there sort of a handoff and why was that? And the, and the book surmises, and this will be on the quiz, that, that the reason is, is because, you know, when you're under strict religious control, we talked about the Shiites in Persia, right? You know, sometimes science isn't something that people are allowed to mess with. You know, it's, there's, there's more restrictions put on learning, so learning doesn't flourish as much. And also the cultures might tend to be closed to the outside world. So if there's no exchange of ideas with other cultures, learning doesn't flourish as much. So that's one of the reasons briefly why knowledge, or at least some historians and theorists think that knowledge really kind of kind of was, uh, you know, took off um, in, in uh, or technology in the Western world and, and really didn't in the Middle East again until later, like now. So, so anyway, read about that because that's the enlightenment is all, it's, you know, everything in one. It's hard to ex explain to you the enlightenment. Well, what came out of it was, uh, you know, scientific theory, you know, that we use today. That, like, how do you prove something with evidence? And the other thing that came out of it was the idea of natural rights, all right? Our whole legal system, our whole government system is based on enlightenment ideas of the social contract. There's a guy you're going to read about, John Locke, in here. And he was a guy who said, hey, wait a minute. You know, all of us are under the rule of kings, and kings are only kings because they said they were kings. Like, hey, God said I was a king, and they amassed power. But, you know, they aren't elected. There's no democratic government of any kind. So the Enlightenment theorists like John Locke started to think about this in terms of the social contract. Like, we all have natural rights, and, and we can be led by someone, but we're going to have a contract, a social contract with that person. That's what we have in the U.S. today. We have a social contract with our politicians. You know, if we don't like them, we'll eventually vote them out of office if we can, if they don't sue us. But anyway, you know, that's what comes out of the Enlightenment, this liberalism, this idea that there, there can be democracies and that the people are important and that people can think of their own and there's new ideas about science and new ideas about experiments and new ideas about um, uh, just philosophy in general. So besides the, you know, like Newton and, you know, uh, you know, physics and all of that stuff starts to develop like crazy. And then like Adam Smith. So many of you haven't heard of Adam Smith. Some of you have, but he's a big deal because he's sort of the guy who figures out, he's called the father of capitalism, but he's so much more than that. He's the first guy to figure out, Hey, there's always going to be supply and demand in the world. In other words, if you want to write blogs for a living to make money and people want to read your blogs and they're willing to pay a little bit, then that's a supply and demand. You're supplying someone with something they want and they're paying you. You know, it's the same with, with you know, there's markets. So uh, Adam Smith said markets would self-destruct over time. So for example, gasoline cars right now, eventually a long time down the road, I hope because I actually like my gas car, uh, will be replaced by electric cars. So it's, it, it's destructing of markets. Adam Smith saw that markets are dynamic and that capitalism works because there, there are. If people have something uh, that they want and you have that to sell, then that starts this little economy, okay? And that's how jobs work. You know, you're getting paid 
because you're doing something that someone needs. And Adam Smith figured all this out. And really, that happened during the period of enlightenment. Also, I'm up to 14 minutes. I'm so sorry. Um, so the social contract I talked about, really important as a basis for democracy, because if, if we don't have a contract with our representatives, then we don't have a voice and we don't want that. I mean, that's the constitution is totally based on the social contract and we wanna make sure we have a say in our governments. Otherwise, uh, someone will tell us what, what we can and can't do and we don't like that very much, right? So the two questions that are gonna be on the quiz from this chapter, why, generally speaking, did scientific and intellectual inquiry tend to die out in these East Asian cultures? And uh, I don't know what the exact question is going to be uh, or not yet, but it's going to be around page 580. And it's going to be this idea that uh, science and uh, outside the box thinking didn't advance as much in East Asia and in China uh, because of either stricter religions uh, or stricter limits on what could be shared or printed. So that's a quiz question somewhere in there. And then the second quiz question is gonna be on John Locke and this idea of the social contract. And the question is gonna be something like, why was John Locke's idea of a social contract important, especially to maintaining a robust democracy? In other words, why is it important that we have a constitution and we have a voice? Uh, and, and how does it sort of relate to what we're reading about all the way back in the early 1700s. So those are the quiz questions. I'm sorry this lecture went so fast. I hope it wasn't too confusing, uh, but we had a lot to cover in a short period of time. If you have any questions, please reach out to me. Uh, if you need to know anything else or you're just curious about anything we're reading, please reach out to me. Uh, if not, be safe, go Rockets, uh, go Blue, by the way, also, see? All right, see you guys next week. Take care, bye-bye.